Hi, everyone. Welcome to Chapter 8. Chapter 8 is about location, planning, and analysis. Uh, chapter 8 marks about the halfway point of the semester, so uh, congratulations on making it this far. Um, we're going to be discussing the idea of when you need to add a new facility, um, where should you locate it, uh, whether that's a you know expansion of existing facilities to a new location or a brand new um, facility for a brand new business. And so let's uh, let's get started, shall we? So um, several reasons why you might have a need for uh, determining a new location, making a location decision, um, adding a new facility would be the main main one of those. So you're expanding markets, right? Or um, you've got significant growth in your current market, and um, so you, uh, you even if you expanded the existing facilities, you still wouldn't be able to meet that demand. Uh, maybe there's not enough space next to where you're currently at, right? So you can't expand outward. There's not uh, not the not the room to do that. Or maybe you're expanding globally, and so you need to be closer to uh, another location. There might be, um, you know, uh, natural resources. If you're very high upstream in the supply chain and you use raw materials, I mean, you know, think of like a old gold mine, right? You know, or a, an oil well, it dries up, you got to move to a new location. So depletion of basic inputs, um, shifting markets, maybe it's just not as uh, trendy anymore, but there's a, uh, you know, a region where your product has become very, um, very hot, um, or just the cost of doing business is cheaper. Maybe you are a movie production studio, but um, you know, Tennessee is giving tax breaks to come and film there, or some other states giving tax breaks. So you go there to get the tax breaks in that location because of the cost savings. Um, location decisions are very uh, street strategy oriented. They are long-term, high investment, um, high resource uh, taking uh, in terms of human capital and finances. Um, you uh they're very important to the overall supply chain um where you locate your facility is going to matter in terms of shipping costs transportation um, the supply of raw materials etc uh, you base your decisions typically on potential profits or cost associated with uh, the decision and also customer service factors um, again, your position in the supply chain will have a determination. If you're at the end of the supply chain, if, you know, like a retail store, you're going to want to lo locate um, in a, you know, uh, a good location in town for your service, right? Um, you know, a lot of restaurants end up in the same uh, area. Um, a lot of um, shopping malls have strip malls nearby and you know, uh, just accessibility, um, the customer demographics that you're trying to reach, uh, traffic issues, maybe, you know, there's going to be a lot of construction here. And so you're not going to want to open a re new retail shop here because there's construction is not going to be done for the next three years or something. Um, if you're in the middle of the supply chain, you wanted to kind of navigate uh, between both the suppliers and your markets where you're going to be serving. And if you're at the beginning, then, well, you need raw materials. Do so you need to be located near those? Um, if you are a web-based retail organization, effectively you become location uh, independent, other than, of course, you know, being located near enough to your distributors that can ship your product. Uh, the criteria for uh, considering where to build your new facility is going to, of course, depend on where you're at in the supply chain. And so there's not a one size fits all uh, method of evaluation. We'll get into those quantitative methods of evaluation later in the uh, lecture and then in our practice problems video. Um, you might look at um, the um, supply chain configuration across your entire network. So, um, you know, you've got existing probably products already that are that are supplying you if you're expanding and so you know locating in a way that makes sense for your same suppliers to be able to um, accommodate both of those facilities without uh, exorbitant costs there are uh, some benefits into locating um, globally not just within the region or uh, country in which you currently operate 
Um, one, it opens up new potential markets. Two, um, there's typically going to be some cost savings. Um, a lot of that's going to be due to labor. You can find cheaper labor in other countries. There are legal and regulatory issues uh, in some countries that you don't have in others, depending on what is, you know, um, uh, socially and morally acceptable in those countries. Um, again, financial costs, not just cost savings, but potential uh, profits. And then there are disadvantages as well, though. Um, one is your transportation costs are going to be very high uh, if you are shipping from overseas. They just are, right? As opposed to shipping within the same state or country. There are costs with security. You need to make sure your facilities are well secured because of potential turmoil in those countries. Um, the labor might be unskilled until they have enough experience producing that part. If you, if uh, you know, iPhones were being made in China for a long time. Now they're being made in India. At first, the results weren't so great. Now they're getting better because they're getting more skilled there. Um, so uh, there might be restrictions, uh, tariffs put on uh, imports potentially. Um, so higher costs or just not being able to import into, into some countries. Um, you get a, you know, the PR bad bad rap for not locating uh, within your country. You know, uh, in here in the USA, you know, uh, people might uh, uh, gravitate towards made in the USA products or criticize you for uh, moving jobs overseas. Um, there could be potential productivity issues. Uh, and then in addition to disadvantages, there's some extreme risks potentially. Um, some of those include intellectual property rights. So we have very strict IP laws here in the US when it comes to trademarks, patents, copyrights. However, not every country has that. Um, if you go on Amazon and you go to purchase something, um, there's you know 20 variations with 20 different companies that make the same product because likely some manufacturer had their uh, product made overseas and then that country just you know stole the blueprints and plans for that and all the research and development that your company did went to benefit them and now they're making it themselves under a different label this happens a lot with vehicles uh, in other countries uh, and electronics those are two of the big ones uh, there could be political instability and unrest or terrorism that could lead to severe security issues, um, danger, hazards, uh, violence you have to be weary of, um, economic instability, you know, a, 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 uh, an economy could collapse potentially based on uh, turmoil. Um, there are certainly ethical considerations, uh, and, you know, as some countries you know, we just saw the World Cup in Qatar, and most of those facilities were made by um, indentured servants who, you know, had to spend their migrant workers. However, they were uh, uh, honestly just slaves, and uh, just thousands of them died building those facilities. So, some certain ethical considerations into lo locating your next World Cup in certain countries across the world. Um, cultural dif <laughs> differences you have to be aware of. What's acceptable in one place might not be acceptable in another place. And then just overall quality of the product. If you're gonna manage uh, your operations on a global scale, there are um, you know, risk of miscommunication. Um, you need to be able to develop trust. Um, there are some countries where corruption and bribery is the norm. I'm not saying we're not one of them. We just call them lobbyists. Um, there are of course travel costs. Uh, associated with, uh, you know, having your management operations, um, CEOs, anybody um, going overseas to train people, your training and development team, uh, lots of travel costs there. Um, and then also, of course, you know, you just might have people not willing to relocate, even if it's temporary to go and train a team, they might not want to go overseas for an extended period of time. They might have families or other things going on in their life here in the US or just have no interest in going over there or worries about potentially being in some countries. Um, there is a, some, some general procedures to follow uh, when it comes to location decision analysis that are uh, relatively universal and then some specifics depending on um, you know, uh, other factors like where you're at in the supply chain. 
So the general steps are A, you decide what criteria you're going to use to evaluate. Okay, so match that criteria to your strategy. Um, identify which factors are important in the decision. Are certain markets important? Are the raw materials important? Are certain customer service issues important? Are cost important? Right. So identify which factors you're going to be using as part of your criteria. Um, and then develop the alternatives. Identify uh, several options on where to locate, meaning it could be various countries or regions or smaller communities or just sites within communities. Um, develop those alternatives. I'm either going to you know, open my store at uh, uh, you know, my new retail store at 71st in Garnett or 41st in Peoria. Let's weigh the pros and cons of both, right? Um, and then, you know, once you've developed your list of alternatives, then you evaluate them based on all those factors you previously decided were important or not, cost, customer access, uh, et cetera, and then make your decision. Okay, so that's your steps one through four. Um, when you're identifying what region, again, just a, a kind of a rehash location of your raw materials, if you're especially if you're up uh, stream in the supply chain, if you're a supplier, location of marker, markets as you get closer to the end of the supply chain becomes more important, uh, labor factors such as costs, um, you know, whether unions are common there or whether, you know, the minimum wage is higher in this state or this state. Um, those are factors. Uh, are there skilled employees here? If you're a tech company, maybe you want to locate in uh, Austin or, you know, somewhere in Silicon Valley or somewhere where, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, access to skilled uh, you know, technical computer uh, personnel. Um, other factors might include the climate. Uh, you might want to, you know, go somewhere warm or cold, depending on your product or desires of the people going to open up that facility. Uh, taxes you might have to pay. Again, I talked about, uh, you know, film crews deciding on a uh, on where to shoot their next movie, and then certain states or cities might uh, might give a, a tax incentive. You know, if you if you ever watch the um, uh, we call them the, the the Batman movies, the Dark Knight ones with Christian Bale. They they you know, Gotham was filmed in Pittsburgh because uh, they got a tax break in, to film in Pittsburgh, so uh, that plays an important location there. Uh, some some strategies for opening uh, multiple plants. Um, oh, I'm sorry, some multiple plant strategies. Right, so you're either going to have a, a, a um, strategy wherein you have a, what's called a product plant strategy. Um, you build all the products and product lines in uh, separate plants that supply that domestic market. So you've got one plant in the U.S. that supplies the U.S. You've got one uh, plant in uh, in Europe that supplies all of Europe, right? Or or what have you? Because Europe's like the size of the U.S. because we're one gigantic country. It's too big, man. It's too big. I think Texas overlays most of Europe too, right? Anyway, um, market area plant strategy. So um, you've got uh, multiple plants within a certain geographic region. You've got all of your North America plants, um, several of them. But, you know, the one in, in the U.S. might supply parts of Canada. Canada might supply parts of the U.S. Uh, based on uh, the geographic region, uh, not just in the, the country or domestic market. So not all of the U.S., but, you know, based on uh, regional aspects, that whole market area, and um, even if it crosses borders, your process plant strategy. So this is where you have each of your plants focuses on one part of the process. So the example here is an automobile manufacturer. You've got um, some facilities that make the engine, some facilities that make the body of the car. So you might have a glass facility. You might have, uh, you, you know, all the electronic, uh, the dashboard, the uh, everything else, right? All these things. And then one place puts it all together into the final uh, vehicle. Um, a lot of coordination necessary between those to make sure that uh, because you've got multiple things being made here, 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 that you are, you know, a, you're making an equal amount of them or the right amount of them so that you can uh, uh, match the uh, the final uh, demand for for those vehicles. You don't have too many engines or whatever else. And then general purpose plant strategy, um, flexibility. So very, very highly flexible, customizable um, modular equipment. 
you know, one plant could handle a wide variety, variety of products. Um, I think of food manufacturing where, you know, um, you ever look at the side of a, a of a, uh, of, you know, a bag of, of chips or uh, any box and it might say, uh, you know, warning, uh, this has been packed in a, in a plant that also packs, you know, peanut or soy or dairy products, right? Because of food allergies. And um, they're not just making that one thing uh, at that facility. If you are a service or retail store, some of the considerations you need to be uh, mindful of are that your raw materials are not usually a consideration if you're a retail outlet. Um, customer access is uh, um, really important if you are a restaurant, a hotel, a retail store, um, but not important if you're something like a call center, right? So if you look around, um, you know, here in Tulsa, we've got call centers that are in, you know, um, they've rented out a floor of a, of a building. Um, you know, I, a long time ago, I worked in a call center in the Cityplex Towers, and there's a number of different uh, offices in, in the Cityplex Towers over by ORU. And, um, you know, the location there didn't matter because customers didn't need to be able to access that. We just needed a space that was uh, cheap and, and uh, accessible by the employees, right? So, um, consideration there, uh, tend to uh, be profit or revenue driven. So you worry about your demographics, um, what part of town should I locate because of affluence or because of traffic volume? Is there a lot of competition? Uh, sometimes that's actually a good thing. You'll see what's called clustering very often where similar types of businesses are located next to one another, even, you know, um, at, uh, uh, you might see two types of restaurants that are very similar to one another right next to each other. Um, I've seen a Jimmy John's right by a Jersey Mike's, pretty similar type of, uh, you know, sub-based sandwich uh, restaurants. Uh, but, you know, all of 71st Street is, you know, they call it Restaurant Row, I think, here. Or is that another state I lived in? I can't remember. But uh, a lot of restaurants on 71st Street. 71st Street Corridor, is that what, what it's called? Oh, man. There are a lot of cities with different nicknames for that part of town. Um, evaluating location alternatives. So common techniques would include uh, cost, volume, profit analysis. So this is what we learned in chapter five, I believe, uh, decision analysis, where you're, it's, you know, your fixed cost plus your uh, variable cost times production, except that based on where you locate, um, you know, the raw materials might cost more or because of the shipping cost it might cost more for the variable cost right so that's one of the techniques this could this could play into location alternatives we've already covered that in chapter five so we're not going to do uh, we're skipping all of those problems again in chapter eight just know that you know on a quiz it might it might come up again but we're not going to do any quantitative work uh, on the chapter eight we're skipping all those problems just because again we've, we've covered that already uh, the transportation model wherein we look at um, transportation costs, map it out um, across uh, various locations. Um, that's not something we're gonna cover in depth in this class either, because that's really a type of linear programming. Um, uh, there is a chapter on linear programming at the end of the book. Um, uh, we're not likely to cover any of that in this class. At this time, a uh, future version of this class, uh, once, uh, once quant methods becomes uh, comes out of the business core, I believe we are going to be covering linear programming. So if I reuse this video, uh, just know that right now we are not covering linear programming in ops management. However, in the future, I believe we will be uh, putting that in in one of the later chapters. Um, factor rating is all about um, uh, applying weights to what factors you care the most about and then rating each of your um, various uh, location alternatives based on the weighted average of those points. And then we've got the center of gravity method. This is where we take um, all of the markets we serve and we map them out on an X, Y coordinate. And then we take the average of our X coordinate and the average of our Y coordinate and that tells us where on the map we should locate because it's the most centrally located uh, area for those markets. And with the center of gravity method, you can also apply a weight to each of those X locations if 
the amount of products you have to ship to them differ. So there's two variations on the center of gravity method we will be covering. So factor rating and center of gravity method, the ones we are gonna cover in chapter eight, as far as quantitative work goes. So again, uh, cost, profit, volume analysis, that's what we've covered in chapter five, fixed cost plus variable cost times quantity. And we use that as our sole determination of uh, where to factor, uh, where, to, where to determine our, our, our spot. So factor rating, again, it, it doesn't even have the slide over transportation uh, because that's covered in uh, one of the later chapters in this book. That again, as of this recording, we are not covering future uh, versions of this class, uh, likely will be starting with uh, uh, potentially as soon as fall 23. All right, uh, factor rating. So you determine what factors are relevant, maybe it's Proximity to existing uh, source of raw materials, proximity to our current facilities. It might be how how uh, how much is the, the volume of traffic? How much is the cost at one location to rent uh, or lease the space? Uh, the size of the facility might matter. The layout, uh, the score of the layout might matter. And then the operating cost might matter. But we determine what percentage each of those things matter. So these are the six things that matter to us by what percentage out of 100 do, do each of those uh, uh, matter? And, and all those weights, all those percentages, they have to add up to one or 100%, right? Same thing. Um, and then you have your you know, management team give each of those factors a score. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So here we have um, six different factors that we care about. Proximity to existing source, traffic volume, rental cost, size, layout. And, and they've determined that um, their decision should be 10% based on proximity to existing source. The uh, volume of traffic should be 5% of how much we care about. All right. Uh, we should care a lot about rental costs. 40% of our decision should be based on the rental cost. 10% uh, of our decision should be based on the size of the facility. 20% should be based on the layout of the facility. So the layout more important than size, as long as they're, you know, uh, like I live in a house that has a lot of square footage, but it's totally impractical and we only have three bedrooms when we should logically have more. So the size is good, but the layout of this house is not good <laughs> for, uh, for what it should be, right? Um, operating cost is 15% uh, of what we care about, right? So we've determined what the weights are now. We do that first, and now we're gonna go to both of the site locations and we're gonna evaluate and we're gonna say, okay, how close is this to our existing source? Oh, it's really close. So we're gonna score that 100 out of 100. And then this one is a little far away. We'll say it's a 60 out of 100. We're giving it a, uh, we're giving it a you know, zero to 100 uh, rating based on subjectivity. Now, we're like a traffic volume. Uh, they're both about the same. So we'll give them both an 80 because if they're both the same, it doesn't really matter, but you're probably scoring them independently. Your rental costs. Um, so this would be something where costs are good. The higher number is good. So the cheaper is, is the better here. You're going to score this a 90, very reasonable, 70, pretty reasonable, um, and so on, right? So you score each of them. Now you just apply a weight. So you know, 10% of 100 plus 5% of 80 plus 40% of 70, 10% of 80. You just do that all the way down and you get a weighted average. Instead of adding these together and dividing by six, you apply a weighted average, something we've done several times already in this class. You know, if you're working in Excel and we'll, we'll go, we'll see it done in the practice problem. But if you're working in Excel, you can just do a sum product function and do this array, this array, and you're done. If you're doing it by hand, you do 10% of this plus 5% of this, 40% of this, and so on. So once you do all that, and again, we have the practice problems to go over this again, so just touch on it briefly, you end up with a weighted average of 70.6 for alternative one and a weighted average of 82.7 for alternative two. And now, um, you know, while some of the scores might have been higher on alternative one, perhaps, if you look at this rental cost, this rental cost was the highest we cared about and alternative two scored much higher, right? You got 100 versus 60 here, but it was only weighted at 10%. So it doesn't matter. This, this huge difference doesn't matter as much as this difference. 10% of 40, is, uh, this 40 difference is four. So that's really a difference of four, right? Uh, this is a difference of 20. 40% of 20 is eight. So even though this was a 40 difference and this is a 20 difference, 
um, this mattered twice as much, uh, ultimately. So, and then this same thing, 20% of 30, right? So 20% of 30 is six. The 30, there's a 30 difference between these two, 20% of 30 is six, still more than the 10% difference of 40, which is four. So this layout and this rental cost ended up being a huge difference, even though this was a 40 difference right there. And this is a huge gap in, in weighted average, you know, 12 points higher, 12.1 points higher for alternative two. So that's a factor rating, simple enough. Uh, center of gravity method. This is again, you map them out on a coordinates. So a um, uh, lot of words to say, here's your four, desti here's your four destinations. I got to serve destination one. Let me uh, zoom in on this here, I think. That'll do it. So I've got a, um, I'll grab my laser pointer. Oh, I can't zoom in laser point. Oh, well, I probably zoomed in enough. So I've got decision destination one, two, three, and four. And each of these, I'm going to overlay an XY coordinate over these destinations. So if this is a map. I'm going to overlay an XY map on top of them. And I see this is two, two, right? Two, two. This is three on the X, five on the Y. This is five on the X, four on the Y. You list the Xs first on this coordinates. Uh, this is eight and then five for these ones, right? So all of my X coordinates are two, three, five, and eight. So I'm going to take the average of two, three, five, and eight. So that's two, three, five, eight. That adds up to 18 and then divided by four because there's four inputs. So you average that out, it's 4.5. And then you do the same thing for your Y coordinates. Two plus five is seven, plus four is 11, plus five is 16. There's four inputs, 16 divided by four is four. So 4.54 4 is gonna be, you can see X, oh, it's right here, yeah. The X coordinates 4.5, Y coordinates four. So this is where I would locate my facility. Yes, yeah, so it's right next to this D3, but it's actually the center of all of them once I weight them out. Weight them out, interesting. W-E-I-G-H-T, weight them out, not, you know, wait for them to leave or whatever. Um, <laughs> if you have quantities as well, we have the ability to app, apply a weight to our X coordinates. So here was the center gravity method that we just did. Two, three, five, and eight was 18. Two, five, four, and five was 16. We divided that by the number of inputs. That's what this formula is saying. It's the sum of all your X coordinates and then the sum of all your Y, y coordinates for the first estimation. And you do, right? So, um, the X coordinate of all your destinations, Y coordinate of all your destinations, add them up and divide by the number of destinations, number of inputs. Uh, so that's how we, what we just did. And then um, if we have quantities, then we can just apply a weight by multiplying each, the sum of our um, coordinates times, uh, so each coordinate times the quantity shipped there. So what does that mean? So if these are our four coordinates on the X, Y, ignoring this weekly quantity for a second, we would just add these up, add these up, divide by four. Instead, we do two times 80 plus three times 90 plus five times 20 plus eight times 100. So we're adding the weight to them. And then instead of dividing by 18, we divide by the sum of our quantities. We're gonna ship 2000 total. So we do three times 80 plus three times nine, 900 plus five times 200 plus eight times 100, add that all together and then divide by 2000. And that gives us where we should ship our X coordinates. That's gonna apply a weight. So what does that look like? Two times 80 plus three times 900 or two times 800, three times 900 plus five times 200 plus eight times 100, you get 6,100 and then divide by 2000, which was all the products we're gonna ship. Divide that, you get 3.05 for your X. Do the same thing for your Y, you get 3.7. So, so not nearly as close to the destination three as the, as the uh, unweighted center of gravity method. We're, we're much further over to the, uh, to the West here um, at three and three seven, as opposed to we we're at 4.54 uh, four before, I think. So 4.54, four, we were right here before where that uh, highlighter is now, keep bumping it. So much further down into the left um, 
for that location. That's because we're shipping a lot more products this way and this way than we are to destination four. If we look, you know, to destination two and three, we're shipping 800 and 900, or sorry, to destination one and two, 800 and 900 products, right? So that's why it's shifted so far to the left. Destination three and four, we're shipping 200 and 100. So 1700 to well, my left on the video, I don't, it's flipped for you guys, but my left. But, so to the left of the map, we're shipping 1700 over here and only 300 over here. Again, that's why it's further over. So we'll see this on the uh, practice problems. I'll, I'll, I'll do, we'll do it again with a calculator and we will uh, do it on Excel for you guys to solve with Excel. Uh, as a reminder, your Excel problem sets uh, must be done using Excel formulas, functions, and showing your work. All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you in the practice problem video.